Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is um, Ian Billingsley, and um, I work for a company called Computer Control Solutions. I'm a LabVIEW architect, and um, we're going to talk about uh, a prag pragmatic approach to aerospace test rig development. So, um, to kick off, last minute edition here. Um, I had giant half female. I had a good look on um, Wikipedia, and uh, I found this lady, which um, she lived in 1885, uh, Augusta Ada King. Apparently, she was the Countess of Lovelace, and um, essentially, she worked with Charles Babbage and. Um, she published the first algorithm intended to be carried out by such a machine. And as such, she was sometimes regarded as um, the first to recognize the full potential of a computer machine and, and the first computer programmer. So I thought that probably is the one I need to pick, really, in, a, in the context of what we're in. So, <coughs> moving on. Um, this is just a, a summary of what we're going to do then. So I'm going to talk about CCS very briefly, project summary, um, and then I'll get into the system architecture. Uh, what, what, what I'm not going to do is deliver anything technical, um, essentially. I'm just going to talk about our approach and what, what worked well for us and what didn't. Um, so the kind of technical implementation of it, I think you've probably all had enough information about that already. So you can you could actually do that any way you like. Um, and most importantly, what we can improve on if we did it again. Uh, and then I'll wrap up with a conclusion. So first of all, um, I've never seen this slide on a screen quite this big. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, <quite laughs> it's actually not as, uh, yeah, it's actually a bit worrying. But um, that, that's, the, that's the CCS team. Uh, Charlie on the left is a, a test and architect. Uh, myself, um, LabVIEW architect. Uh, Barry's our electrical engineer. He's, a, he's actually a qualified machinery safety expert, which comes in really useful. Um, and then Paul, who's a, he's the managing director, he's a LabVIEW architect. And then Morella kind of keeps us all in check and makes sure the projects are going to plan as much as possible anyway. Um, and this picture was actually a rig we sent out recently. And um, following the, 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 little, um, the little thing there, basically, is when for our 25 years Alliance Partner Award, so kind of just to show that we've got a bit of pedigree in there. Um, so moving on, the, um, the project itself, this is, may or may not be the test rig, but it's, it's something very much like this. Um, it's a multi-station flow bench test rig. You've, lots of you have probably seen something or developed something similar to this. Um, so our part of this is we did the electronics and the control system. We didn't actually do the hardware, but we worked with the partner on this. Um, it's got four test stations with uh, exchangeable fixtures and fittings to allow the testing of 79 LRUs on a, on a, um, a military aircraft. Uh, the HMI is on two monitors, as you can see on the arm there. It's got a keyboard and trackball, and these can be moved around to the four different stations as need be by the, by the operator. <laughs> Um, there's guard centers on each door, um, and they can be overridden in certain situations by a, by a key lock exchange system for a limited amount of time, which is governed by the, by the test system. Uh, there's emergency stop buttons around the rig, and um, these, are, these depower all the safety systems and allow the software to end gracefully. Uh, I'll go through this very quickly, but these are the kind of things we're talking about testing. There's a whole list of things there, um, and these are the kind of things they relate to. So ailerons, brakes, tailplanes, all that lovely stuff. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is an advanced jet trainer, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, so our, our test rig covers the testing of all the serviceable parts on this aircraft. So there's quite a sort of range of things it needs to cover. Oh, and the rudder as well, I forgot that. <laughs> so, um, what I've tried to do here is say, we've broken it down into, into four layers of control. Um, so we've got hardware layer, which w is anything below the PC control. So all that good stuff that happens in real time. Um, which we implemented with a compact Rio, as you can see. 
Um, and then we've got a simulation that sits above that. So that is to um, allow us to simulate and override feedback from the hardware layer, which um, comes in very useful. Um, we've got a manual interface layer, which is effectively like a sandbox for the system. It allows us to kind of probe it and measure things in a non-automated way. So we will go into a bit of detail on that shortly. Um, and those two are in lab view. And then uh, the fourth layer is our automated test control, which we use test stand for. Um, so I'll dive in to a bit of detail. Effectively, we're going to talk about what each one is, why we did it, what worked well, and um, what we can improve on. So first of all, hardware layer. Um, so that's kind of, that's a snapshot of one of the control panels, just to sort of give you a feel for what it is. Uh, we actually used a, a, a PILTS in our system to give us um, as a safety controller. And the main reason for that is that we can get, uh, we can get our class three safety assurance from it very easily. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that shortly. Um, we've also got two times uh, NI 9149 Ethernet compact Rio systems, um, and they are acquiring data. We've got, uh, I'm trying to think, something like two, over 200 I.O. on this test streak, so we had to have two of them running, running together. Um, I'll talk about why we've got the PILT. So the PILT gives us our safety performance level assurance. Um, and just talking about the PILT a little bit more, we really like the fact that it's separate to the Compact Rio because we have the safety assurance guy deal with that side of things. And his focus is completely on safety. It's not about controlling and running the test rig. So by the time I come along doing some writing some crazy code, I know that pretty much the rig's going to be safe before we start. Um, that just works for us. People might have different opinions on that, but that's what we like. What, what um, does that do? Does that measure the emergency stops? And yeah, so... Stop uh, yes, it does. Yeah, it's kind of like the electrical safety system. So it's checking the guards if they're opened or uh, e stops are pressed. It will deal with that in an electrical fashion, and it's all got um, redundancy built in. And the way they build the software is kind of like you have to go on a training course to get certified, and you have to take into account certain things. And uh, yeah, it's like a PLC. Yeah, it's like a PLC code, but. You can, there's a pathway to get the safety certification that you need, which is a lot harder if you do it in FPGA, because you end up having to, uh, you have to involve the control system as well, whereas the PILTs won't do that. It's yeah. just, in, it's just cares about the safety side of things. Uh, why do we use FPGA? I think we've already covered this quite heavily, but we completely love it, it's brilliant. Um, why do we love it? because it's lab view, it's what we already write in, so why wouldn't we use it? Um, and uh, just and something that hasn't been mentioned, we really like the kind of C-series industrial connections. It works for us in a rig like this. You can see sort of over there the sort of thing that we end up doing. We bring it out and we've got lovely sort of traceability all the way down to the bottom of the wiring. So um, that's why we do that. Uh, just as a side note as well, we, we Obviously, had to synchronise the data between these two, um, synchronise the FIFOs, and we did that using a digital output signal. So we have a, a, a master clock running on one of them, and then we just use a digital out pulse every time it's acquiring it, it outputs a digital line, and then this one knows right. I need to grab some data now, and then at the top end we can tie the two FIFOs up, uh, essentially because they'll be exactly the same size. So it works. So. What works well, um, the PILTS, as I've already said, gives us a clear safety assurance pathway. Uh, it's separate to the FPGA control algorithms, and that's a good thing. I like that. Um, the FPGA, so there's, there's always sort of late changes with a rig like this, and with the FPGA, you've got a chance of being able to reconfigure what you've done and make it work. So. You know, that, that worked really well for us in this case. Um, in fact, it works in every case. Every job we do, it works really well. Where can we improve? So the PILTs, uh, 
we know when it's tripped, but if we were going to do this again, you can actually read what the, the detailed trip conditions are. And I think we, that would serve us well because there are so many reasons why this rig might stop. So we could definitely improve on that if we did this again. Um, obviously, we could use the C-Series functional safety module. Um, but like I say, for the reasons I've already said, I'd want to see how that implements itself before I dived into it, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. It's because it's all about the safety assurance. I'm not concerned about how they work. It's how easily we kind of get it signed off. Um, that, that's, that's, the, that's the question for me, really. Yeah. I'll just say that I've already got experience with PILTS and uh, mm -hmm. networking them with Modbus, and yes. it works quite well, so yeah. if you want to... We've actually done it on another job since, but yeah. we're too far down the road with this one to go back and put new things on now. I'm not, I'm not putting a... No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not happening. <laughs> um, the one thing that I think has been touched on as well is FPGA code testing and simulation. It's always a bugbear. Um, I'd like to do more, but I just don't think it's possible. And the main reason is because you're integrating with a lot of hardware at the low level, and you just haven't got that hardware available. So if you've got like digital encoders and things like that, you just can't test that code until you've got the sum of the kit together. Um, but because it takes a time to recompile, it's definitely something we should think about doing more of earlier, if there's any way of doing it. <laughs> if anyone's got any ideas. So um, that's the hardware layer. The second part then is the simulation layer. And um, so what is a simulation layer? Well, we essentially, it's, um, it's a layer that simulates the real feedback from the transducers. So um, it's a very thin layer which sits... You can, you can switch it in and out and switch in certain channels, any of your digital channels or your analog inputs, and simulate or override the feedback from the hardware layer. So when you haven't got that FPGA code, you can prove out everything above that by using this. That's, that's the kind of idea. Um, so the FPGA code is two conversion layers mm -hmm. from a, the input sequence. Yeah. So the FPGA code is, is, is the server, essentially, or mm -hmm. two servers, and you've got a client reading that. Um, so you're simulating the, yeah. the, uh, the server output. So what, you, what you're doing is you're not simulating the outputs, you're simulating what's going to come back from your analog inputs and your digital inputs in order to make your code work as you expect it to. So if you switch on a digital output, you're going to expect some feedback from that. Well, you can simulate that with a simulation layer. Okay. You don't actually use the, F the FP FPGA code is effectively taken out at this point. You override what you expect to come back from the FPGA. Yeah, so it's, yeah. is that running on the RT system part no, of the CBO? No, this is then? running on the PC. Okay. It's completely running on the PC, yeah. It's, it runs in the FPGA API, effectively. You just stick it in there, and just, just on a case statement, you, you can switch it in or out. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, oh, you, you'll see how that works oh, in a bit. Yeah, but right. yeah, no, it's fine. So, um, it's a thin code layer. Um, each input value can override, can be configured to override or configure uh, to follow an output channel, which is quite useful because sometimes you want to say, well, you know, I've just set this set point of this thing and I expect this feedback channel to tell me that that set point, the, the feedback's really insane. And for the purpose of proving your code out, that's pretty useful because you might have other stuff that's making sure that's happening and then stopping the test if that doesn't happen, for example. Um, the scope of it is all the analog inputs and all the digital inputs of the, of the test rig. Uh, so it's not actually doing the outputs because there's no point because there's nothing listening at the end of the outputs anyway. That's the idea. Um, we built in a, a, a library of configurations for this as well because our rig was... Some of these are quite tasty in terms of the number of things we had to set up. And we had like lots of LRUs to test. It was pretty useful just to be able to say, well, just recall this unit's setup and, and, and away you go. Um, so 
Yeah, saving profiles, that's useful. Um, right, so what is it? <laughs> here we go. So what I've tried to show here is um, basically this is our FPGA API. I'm putting the code in here, but just to sort of say, effectively we've got our hardware layer. This is where you talk to the, um, the FPGA. And you can just switch it in and out. The real one is much more complicated than this. I can appreciate <laughs> <that>. <laughs> uh, Otherwise, I'll probably be out of a job because <laughs> someone else would do it. But um, essentially, you just switch it in or out as you need it. Um, on top of that, the data that's coming from there can then be overridden by our simulation layer, uh, which is literally just... If, if the setting is set to override it, it takes the value from the front panel and writes over what was coming back from the um, hardware uh, and then pushes that out to the data. I mean, we, we take a copy of it as well, so you know what the last setting was from the, from the simulation interface. But my, I think the point I'm trying to make is that it's very simple, um, and that I like simple stuff because it tends to work well. Uh, so it sits inside the FPGA layer, can act in conjunction with the real hardware to inject faults as well, which I didn't mention, can inject faults, which is useful. Uh, it's a passive front panel. Because this is running continuously, obviously, this is kind of, the data is going through here. So there's a few, there's a few sort of tricks you have to think about in terms of loading up configurations or whatever, because you don't want to hang the process at all. Uh, but nothing, nothing particularly special. Um, it can contain so it can contain specific algorithms to handle more complex simulation requirements. So essentially, what you can do here is you could say, well, you know what, I don't want to just take uh, a copy of what this output setting is and make it the feedback. I want to do something with that before it comes back in. So it might be that the pressure is meant to be half what the output is, or a quarter, or some kind of calculation based on that. Um, so that can contain specific algorithms to handle more complex simulation requirements. So uh, that was a very useful piece of kit for us. Why did we do it? OK. Effectively, we're just, just more testing. So we've done our base testing. But at some point, we want to test more of the code. So we want to test as much as possible. The only thing I can't test is the FPGA, for the reasons I've said. So I'm trying to say, right, let's get all that stuff that we think is going to work, get it running, and, and test it. And we can use this to, to do that, which I'll, I'll show you how it works in conjunction with some of the other parts in a bit. Um, so we're validate, validating the software down to the hardware layer. Um, we're testing every part of the code, and, um, but excluding the FPGA. Uh, and it's... It's something we use mainly before the hardware is built, so it, it comes in very useful just to just to test things out early on. Um, API integration testing, automation layer testing. So this is just the covering that, that in lieu of having access to the test rig and the LRU. So uh, I'll show you how that works in a bit in, in more detail, but that's that's essentially what a simulation layer is. So what works well. Um, it's really important for just getting some faith that your code's going to work at an early point, um, and all these things are going to work together. So you can actually use it to log simulated data as well and see it on a graph and say, well, this is what the thing's going to look like when we, when we run the test. Um, customers like it because they can see something that re represents what they're going to see at the end of the, at the, end of the process. Uh, and it facilitates validation of the manual interface layer and the automation layer. So I'll go into that in a bit of detail, but effectively it's going to help with the other layers higher up because you can use this to, to prove that they work. Um, where can we improve? So we could build more intelligent simulation algorithms. It's not so important with this project, but other projects we've used this on. You, you need something more advanced than that. It's no good just saying, well, we're asking for that. And so the feedback was that. There's some other things that go on. But you end up kind of building the model of the thing you're testing in the end if you're not careful. So you have to kind of find the right balance for that. Um, improved range of analog input simulation data. So again, that's along the same theme. You know, waveforms, lookups, 
based on output values. There's no reason why you can't say, well, if we switch this thing on and set that set point, we expect this waveform back, which is something preloaded on a TDMS or something like that. So um, moving up the tree then, the manual interface layer. Uh, so a manual interface layer is uh, effectively, it allows the operator full control of the test rig for diagnostics and configuration. Um, I'll show you what it is in a minute, uh, but effectively it's your, it's your sandbox for uh, allowing the, uh, the software designer and anyone that wants to tinker with the under, under the hood part of the rig. It allows them to, to do what they want. Um, it's not the operator interface. Uh, you'll see why I'll put that there in red in a minute, um, because it's unapologetically kind of, there's, there's very little uh, automation, in fact there's no automation code in there as possible. Its whole design concept is to be, right, does the hardware work as I expect it to? When I switch that thing on, does the right thing come on? When I put that set point on, do I get the right feedback? And if it doesn't, what's the combination of things I need to do to make it work? Or does the hardware just not work as we expected? So it's the kind of, it's the under the hood sort of interface. Um, this is the sort of thing I recommend if you're building an automation. For in our experience, it's the first thing we do. You know, we always make sure that we've got a way of testing this thing if and when, more like when, it doesn't work as, as your customer says it's going to work. Um, and often it's, it's down to the fact they didn't ask you to do the right things, you know, most of the time. But you're going to have to prove that at some point because they're going to blame your, your rig first of all. So it's all about building in a bit of, bit of um, defence for you for your code relay. Uh, so why do we do it? We're validating the code that the automation lay layer will be driving later on. Um, so again, when we've got these automated test sequences running, we can, um, if something doesn't work as we expect it, we can come into this environment and switch things and go, well, that's what the script says it's doing. Why well, it works here. So something's wrong with the script or there's something different but because because the hardware does what we expect it to do um, and the key thing about this is that the manual interface layer is using all this under the hood is using this, all the same api as the automation layer so if it works in the manual screen basically then it should work in the automation layer that's the kind of where we're going with it um, also, it's really good for just checking all your I.O. If you've got a test rig that's got lots and lots of things that someone's wired up and says they've checked, but you're not convinced, then they can be proven out here. So you can uh, systematically go through all the, all the I.O. and make sure that the signals are as, as we expect them to be. Uh, okay, so that's, that's our um, maintainer interface. Like I say, it's unapologetically crazy. It's based on the hydraulic schematic of the rig. Um, so the idea is that the electrical engineers and hydraulic engineers, they will understand that. And it's been proven because uh, the guys can drive that. These are the, the controls are on the right. Everything on the here, although some of these look like controls, they're not controls. All we're doing is proving that when we switch on one of these solenoids, that the um, right down to the FPGA layer, it agrees with you that when you switch on SV9, the actually the FPGA has put SV9 on, because as you can appreciate, there's a few sort of layers of things that happen before it gets down there. So um, for me, I get a nice warm feeling when I press that button when that one comes on as well. Uh, and then some of these are just, you know, all the analog controls and, and the systems that go, go on top of it. Um, the key concept is that Anything that the automation layer is doing, you can do in this screen in a manual way. Uh, that's the kind of design, design concept by it. Uh, so yeah, but I appreciate, it's particularly on this big screen, it didn't look quite this uh, invasive when I <laughs> went through it on my small monitor the other day, but all I can say is it, it, it works. So the first thing someone is going to want to do when the automation screen, when the automation script doesn't work, is going to say, well, how do, we, how do we get under that? How do we make sure that your automation thing is doing the right thing? And what's the timing for that? You know, maybe it's just a timing issue. So straight away, we can come in here and go, right, 
let's have a look what it's doing. We're switching on that. Then we put this set point on here. We put that on. And um, you can prove it all out. There's other parts to this as well. So we can bring up the simulation interface and uh, inject any of these feedbacks we can override. So we can prove out that the software is working. So you know we can switch on this SV. We can put on an analog output and say, well, you know, if we put that output on there, that input should be reading 20. And when I put 20 in there, connected to T1 oil, I get a 20 on T1 oil on there. That's good. That's a good thing. That means everything in your software is connected and working in the right way. So we, we said the delivery's in the early okay. post-process. Yeah, yeah. It allows you to test the wiring. Yeah, yes, so exactly. It's usually a free wiring. Exactly, exactly. You still all this hardware. So that, that's ex that is exactly the point. Um, we use it for that, but we just keep it because... You know, we why wouldn't you put a password on it? But, yeah. you know, it's, it's the first thing you're going to need. The minute you get rid of it, you're going to need it back again. So. Some of our bigger projects, it's, it's the next milestone of what we've Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. So I like it as well because you can start from the I.O. You know, you've got a nice, warm, okay, this, the scope of this is, is the hardware. So you can say, I've got all this I.O. It goes somewhere. Where does it go? Well, let's use the hydraulic schematic to try and map that out. It feels like a nice kind of way of feeling your way through where, where, the, where the job's going to go. Um, because we're in on two screens, that, that's only one screen. On the other screen, in your maintainer interface, we've got, we've got a couple of tabs, which is like a standard data acquisition tab, which is great because you can log any of those channels and uh, acquire some data. Yes, you can't access it. It's just locked out. If we've got different password logins at the front end, but so you can't you can't save the configuration of the simulation interface. It always starts up without it switched on, and then all of these all of the magic buttons that you see sort of there they just don't exist. You can't call it from anything other than logged in as like a, a, a OEM administrator level. So it's kind of that. You're right. It's a very good question. Well, there. Yeah. Night, yeah, 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 yeah. Which is a standard yeah. deviation, and the average was yeah. 100% past. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the other, the other thing we did, we've got a big yellow flag that says the simulation interface is running in some way when you're running the actual test itself. It's kind of, there are some simple things you can do. You're right, a big sore thumb generally, generally helps with that. Uh, so the other tabs, the other screen then is to running on two tabs. Um, as Steve said, rightly so, that this is, this is the bit for doing your electrical commissioning because you've got a list of channels. It's effectively what you just saw on the other screen, but in a list format. So all the analog inputs, uh, all the digital inputs, all the analog outputs as well. We have, we have everything because, we, we, because we're controlling analog outputs on the FPGA, what we tend to do is keep our... We're going to want to scale those in a way we're going to want to push them out as a voltage in some way, so we keep all the scaling of the inputs and the outputs uh, in, in one list, and then we can just index that list. It works really well for us. The digitals are here. These are um, just for checking whether they're on or off. If you can't find them on that crazy schematic, on that crazy drawing there, then you can just come to here and go, well, I know it's channel, index, whatever. And the, again, it's the same for the digital outputs. You can check when you switch one on that the FPGA agrees that that digital output is on. Um, it might be something as simple as the e-stop strips, and so the FPGA hasn't put that digital output on, but you get a warm feeling when you see a light come on when you switch something on and off. Mm -hmm. Ian, do, yeah. you, um, do you measure latency when you're, when you're um, looking at the, the accuracy of digital inputs and outputs? Uh, we don't. We don't. It wasn't, it wasn't really required. something that was required for this rig, so, I, you know, it was... It just was, didn't seem any requirements at any point, so we didn't do that. Uh, yes. So all of the outputs, like you drive a digital out. Yes. Do you tap into that digital out as a feedback channel, or are you looking at the thing that it affected? Like I turn a valve on, yeah. I'm reading something back from the valve. No. Well, so what we're doing is we're actually reading the digital output 
at the, as far as we can on the FPGA. So at the point where the FPGA physically switches that relay on, then we, we read that as, as an input back in and just um, synchronize it with all the other analog input data. So you're right, we don't know, but we've done everything we can software-wise to say uh, that that digital output is on. Um, because if, if, if electrically wise it's been taken care of, there'll be a digital input for that anyway, uh, which is kind of where this works again, because you know, if you're switching something on here, if there's a thing here which says, okay, I'll switch this pump on, it's okay, ready, running, they, they're all gonna be in the right place. And it, it kind of works, you know? Uh, but if you haven't got that thing to check it electrically, then all you can do is say, well, I've switched the relay on. Um, but you probably know yourself, you'd be surprised the number of times you think you've switched that relay on, and everyone says it's not on, and you get egg on your face when you dig down into the code and find out it's not on for some strange reason. Probably because you've put some other algorithm there to make it not be on. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, just on this one. Did you manage to get much uh, code reuse from the maintainer interface with the actual automation side yes, of things as well? Yes, completely. That that's right. one of the main kind of design ideas as well. That all yeah. the, so I haven't shown you any code, but all yeah. of the, all of this stuff here, um, these are effectively the the um, the inputs to the automation layer. The right. WIS are abstracted out yeah, and they're taken. Brilliant. It uses the same API uh, plugin calls, and that's really important uh, yeah. because when we when we replicate the automated test here, we want to make sure that if it works here, it should be working it's in, testing in, it out as in well. the automated test yeah. circuit. It's pointless if you've got different code because yeah. you've right. got two sets of code. Sorry, um, did you know at the beginning of the project how many uh, LRUs you're going to be testing? Um, uh, or did new ones come in towards ones the end? Came in. So how do you how have you got around the sort of digital I/O stuff? Have you got it that uh -huh. uh, certain I/O is for a particular product, or do you multiplex yeah. between? Or so th there were some added. We had the standard sort of twenty percent. You know, if you've got if you've used up eight of your digitals out inputs or outputs, you probably want a thirty-two card, or a r rather than buy exactly what you want. So we were we were correct on the design for that, so we had the capacity to take care of whatever they added. So it is per unit, is per sort of I.O., isn't it? So you don't, um, so you, yeah. The, the scope of this will do all of them, yeah. So this doesn't, it doesn't, we don't change the I.O. for the different LRUs. Uh, the other thing we were careful to do is that, so in, in some of these clusters, when I begin, when I started mapping it out, I just put all of, all of the digital inputs in there, even the ones that weren't being used. And then right at the end of the project, the ones that weren't being used, I just hid those. But I kept everything in the right order. So if there were 32 digital inputs, I put 32. And then the next 32, I didn't truncate that list by the ones they were using because, you know, they're always going to add some more in. Um, but you're right. My, my kind of argument with that is that if, if, the rig, if the rig is capable of doing it, you should be able to cater for it in your software. But if someone comes along and says, well, we need another... 50 digital inputs, that's going to break a lot of things on your rig, your hardware design anyway. So, yeah. you know, was it, needs, it needs a... Was there a lot of commonality between uh, different LRUs or are they all very different? So, that's a good question. Um, they're all pretty similar, but they're all written in a different way by a different person. And the kind of nature of the beast of this kind of test rig, you have to do the test to the letter of how it's the, the, the test... Uh, requirements are written so um, a lot of it it will be things like literally things like switch on the solenoid and then put a pressure on or, and then ramp it in a certain way and another guy will have written a test for a very similar unit uh, but it'll be slightly different he'll do it the opposite way around and it may be relevant it probably isn't relevant so you could use common sequence code to do that, but you have to do it in the way it's specified in the test sequence. This you know. is a rig for a particular aircraft. Yeah. Program, yes, that's right. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to get much change. No. Zero. Specifically for one piece of hardware. The, the guys that wrote, the, the, the guys that did the original test are probably no, no longer with us. Around. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, so again, that's the kind of idea of building things like that, and because we can, 
they're going to want to change how they want to do the tests as they come to the point where they put the units on. Things are going to change. So we had to work with them on that. Um, how are we doing for time? Is that me? Was that reset? I didn't even see that came down. Okay. Are we? Do you want me to? Am I all right for another five minutes, or was it a thirty-minute window? There's a thirty-minute slot, and I was thirty minutes on. Okay. Right. I'll run through this quick then. Sorry. <laughs> it's Steve's fault. He kept asking me questions. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, the last one then. So the automation layer. Uh, all the good things that you'd expect from test stand. I don't need to go into the details of these. Why did we use it? Because we're abstracting um, the business logic from the test side of things. Uh, they're all the things you can see at any, any NI sort of advertised test stand presentation. But it, that's why we went for it. It works. Big thing, the sequence analyzer. You can validate your test, your automated test sequences. That helps a lot. Uh, report audit, audit reports. We call it so the standard report you get from test stand. Uh, it's really useful to make sure that your test has done what you said, what you thought it was doing. So we use that a lot. Uh, the test interface then. So this is this is very different to the manual interface, but it's to sort of give you a feel, quick feel for how it how it how it uh, lives. We've got. Um, We've got a, a, a test sequence calling into uh, the, a test interface with um, a sub panel, which is the, the plugin. So each step here effectively calls a, another VI, which um, is, is, a, is, a, is a plugin VI. And the important thing there is that we wanted a really, uh, we wanted a single user interface for the operator. We didn't want the operator to see things popping up and things like that, so it was really important we got that. The kind of technical implementation of that is, is not straightforward uh, because of different contexts and whatever that Test Stand likes to use, but there are, there are some tricks which, um, if I had more time, I could tell you about it. <laughs> so the other, the other key thing we did is we ran a sec we, we launched a separate VI, separate to the Test Stand interface, which is all ran by uh, the LabVIEW main executable. And that just runs all the time to uh, get the status from the FPGA and uh, handle things like the, the data acquisition in the background. Because one thing about test stand is when it calls a plugin, uh, it kind of hands over control to the plugin. So you have to have things running in the background all the time if you've got a test rig, basically. So that was another problem area that we had, which we think we found some neat kind of tricks to, to sort that out. Um, but that's, that's essentially what the operator sees when they're running a test. These, this bit changes all the time. These bits, they get different images, different sets of instructions, but this bit stays the same. So uh, the housekeeper then, so the top part of the code, um, we've got a, back, like I say, background monitoring process. that changes the images based on what it needs, uh, test reconditioning, handles the data logging process for us, displays LRU renders. It can also um, show you, it can pull back that maintainer interface. It's not actually pulling back that code, it's just a, it's just a strict type def basically, but showing exactly the same information. This is only available for the maintainer but it gives them some comfort that actually, I just ran that test in the maintainer interface, now I'm running it in the scripts. Is it switching the same things? Is the, are the bits I'm interested in showing the same information? Uh, we've got an advanced debugging tab, which is as messy as heck, but it's basically, that's just for me to kind of create profiles and um, while the, while the uh, automated test sequence is running, we can inject in some TDMS data that because this solenoid should have switched like this according to what the customer's saying. Uh, all sorts of things like that. We also do a lot of post-processing of the data, so when we acquire it to validate how long this solenoid will take to switch or this, that and the other. Obviously, before you've got the hardware, you need to be able to simulate that, so we can use this screen to, uh, to, to, to do that and then change where the triggers are and measured points and all this, that and the other on that data we've just acquired. 
So you can use this with the, the live system as well to say, well, you know what? We thought it was going to come up to this pressure. It only got up to that pressure. But if we'd have triggered at that pressure it did come at, the sequence would have worked perfectly. So again, it's another way of showing you, uh, the customer that look, you, your um, hardware is not working as you thought it was. What worked well? Um, time saved, not rebuilding the, uh, the test executive. Um, the test sequence uh, was developed in parallel with the main system development. That's a really good reason for not reinventing your test executive because you can actually say it's forced abstraction. You know, there is no way the test stand guy is ever going to be writing lab view code and that, that, that can be a really good thing. Um, the customer buying easy because it's a, a customer off the shelf system. Customers like that. That reduces their risk in you. So, um, that was, that was very easy for them to, to, to buy into that. Um, simulation audit reports to prove test coverage. So early on, with the use of the simulation interface and the fact we'd written a lot of the sequences, we could prove to the customer with a test stand report that the test would do what we said it was going to do when we've got the hardware. Um, so that, that was really important to them. Onboard the customer to customise the test after delivery. The classic thing where you deliver a system, it doesn't. The customer wants to, to tweak it, um, and um, effectively, we were able to kind of get get that over back to them and say, "Well, look, it's, it's easy. You don't have to do any lab view code. You don't have to buy into our test executive. This is how you do it. Basically, if you want more information, and I have got the training courses to do that. And by the way, if you want to." change it in the future, you can do that. You don't need us guaranteed because it's not, it's something that's third party. Uh, where can we improve? Hardware in the loop systems are various standards which we're looking at at the moment and um, automate the loading of simulation libraries to include, improve simulation runs. So it's a bit clunky in the test sequence with the simulation interface. We could get that a bit better to do that but it's, we, don't, we only used it to prove the sequences out. So it wasn't worth investing that time. So, summary, hardware layer gives us a uh, clear safety assurance pathway. Um, simulation layer, early code integration testing. Manual interface layer, uh, it's all about the test debugging and the automation layer. Um, the big thing about it was that it was, we, could, we could get out of that project because uh, the customer took ownership of the final changes and everyone was happy because they didn't want to pay us to be there longer than we wanted to be there, and we really didn't want to be standing there tweaking parameters on a test sequence for the next six months. So um, that's all. Has anybody got any other questions? Apologies about running over there. Definitely Steve's fault. <laughs> no, thank you very much.